Nearly 30 years ago, seven paintings, including a priceless Cezanne, were stolen from a private collection in America. As the years passed, Michael Backwin, who owned the paintings, thought he would never see his precious Cezanne again. The police couldn't find it. Neither could a private detective he hired. For three decades, the pursuit of the paintings followed a trail from America to Monaco to Russia to Switzerland and eventually to London. But most mysterious of all was the identity of the man who had possession of the paintings all those years and who was finally exposed in an English courtroom. In the 1970s, Stockbridge, Massachusetts, 100 miles west of Boston, was the starting point of a bizarre story of dishonesty and double dealing involving one of the most important paintings in the history of art. It's a wealthy community, a population of 2,000 set in the Berkshire Hills. The town has a great many well-to-do families, families with old money, with art collections. Houses are spread out over a, a wide area. Um, it's, it's mountainous and woody. Certainly not unusual not to see your neighbor's house from your own. Stockbridge was also home to Michael Backwin, one of the heirs to a unique and priceless art collection. At the time, Michael Backwin owned a restaurant and bar in the town, the Avalok Inn. Its clientele included not only local people, but also wealthy tourists vacationing in the area. I had a little resort in Sockbridge for 10 years in the 60s, and it was, a, it was a fun area in those days. There was a lot of young people in their late 20s who liked music, and it was fun, and it was not so terribly expensive. During the 1970s, things began to change in the town. There were new people coming in with a lot of money and local tough kids uh, taking advantage of that in a major crime wave beginning, drug dealing, uh, assaults, and then theft. This was Backwin's home. Hidden away up a long drive, it was not easy to find. Backwin's residence is not an ostentatious place. It's a one story and it's large, but it is secluded. Inside this house was one of the most important paintings in the history of modern art. It's by the French artist Paul Cezanne and shows a simple still life, some fruit in a jug on a crumpled white tablecloth. The Cezanne painting is one of his very typical and quite beautiful still lives. And this is really an exercise in new ways of looking at painting. So he would paint the apples in a way as sculpture and becoming more and more abstract, which eventually led a few years later to the invention of Cubism by his direct successor Picasso. On Memorial Day weekend in May 1978, Mr. Backwin, his wife and children, went to his parents' house in New York. Leaving the family home in Stockbridge empty. At some point that weekend, thieves drove up the long pathway to the Backwin house. In order for anyone to have done the theft, they would have had to know that they were going there. It's a fairly long driveway gone in. Given the number of paintings and the size of them, they would have had to load them in a car. And there's not any really good location nearby to park a car and hide it. There was no security gate to stop them at the entrance. No security lights. 
no security cameras. People claimed that I had not locked the house when we were away, so I claimed that I had. And... There was no sign of a forced entry into Beckwin's home, but there might have been a reason. By the front door, there was a small stone frog, and underneath the frog was the key to the house. We didn't have any lines. It was expensive. I, I felt I was living in, out in the boondocks. I mean, there are wonderful things in New York City, Chicago, San Francisco. Why would anybody go in the boondocks to take paintings? And I just thought there was a very safe place to have them. The thieves seemed to know what they were looking for. They went straight into the formal dining room. Here, there were seven paintings hanging on the walls, including Cezanne's priceless Bouillard et Fui. The thieves removed the six minor paintings, including two by Chaim Soutine. One by Maurice de Vlaminck. And one by Maurice Utrillo. The Utrillo was insured and the Vlamanc was insured. And I think only one of the Soutines, I don't know why, but one of the Soutines was insured. The thieves took the six minor paintings out to the waiting car. Michael Backwin had not insured his priceless Cezanne. The thieves removed the masterpiece from its frame and took that out to the car as well. They simply loaded up the trunk and drove back down the track and away. Seven paintings in the back and one, the Cezanne, worth at the time around $15 million. It was like losing a child, although not really. Um, the Cezanne particularly, uh, I had seen that painting years before my parents bought it and I just loved this painting and it was the most expensive and the last great painting my parents bought, I convinced my mother to really buy it, my father, and uh, then I finally got it. <laughs> and I had to, you know, quiet the most beautiful thing in the whole world, and then it was taken away. And there was extremely uh, emotional time. I actually said to my wife, you take care of this, I can't face this. The stolen paintings were part of one of the largest and most extravagant private art collections in America. Actually, my mother. This picture is. It had been put together by Michael Backwin's parents. My father came from around Utica, New York. He was the star of his family, but he came from a very, very poor family, and uh, they sacrificed a great deal for him. And he became a teacher, and that's where he met my mother, who came from a quite a wealthy uh, Chicago family. Backwin's mother, Ruth, was heir to a Midwest meatpacking business, built up by her father at the end of the 19th century. Both Backwin's parents became pediatricians. And in the 1920s, they left the Midwest for Europe. They loved each other very much, and they always, and they respected each other. And uh, I think they were great together. The couple eventually settled in Paris. At the time, the French capital was a magnet for artists and writers from all over Europe and even America. Ruth and Harry moved easily in the artistic world and soon began to amass a formidable collection of mostly Impressionist and post-Impressionist art. They had paintings going from anybody from, I guess, the oldest. They had an El Greco, but mostly they were with post-Impressionists. 
and they seemed to have a wonderful eye for art. They didn't seem to compromise because they bought always very good things. And I, I'm very proud of the collection they, they put together and the kinds of people they were. My parents would take me to meet these artists when we went to France after the Second World War. And so I've met Picasso, and I met Matisse, and uh, I met Utrillo, and I've met Flamenc with them. It was part of this collection that Michael Backwin would, in time, inherit. And what happened is that eventually my parents started to give the paintings to their children. Backwin himself devised the system for the share-out. My mother said to me, well, you decide how to do this. Well, I knew which paintings, which people liked, or which my sister's and brother. So I thought the fairway would go. My brother's the oldest, he gets the first choice, but I knew that my brother would have taken the Van Gogh. My sister Pat gets the second choice, and Bobby gets the third choice, and I get the fourth choice. But then I get the fifth choice, and it goes back the other way. So that way I figured out that I could get my favorite picture, which was the Cezanne. The theft of the Cezanne years later was heartbreaking for Michael Backlund. I was extremely upset and angry and frustrated and sad and everything. And, and, and also, just, I had to tell my mother. And when I called her, uh, she said, well, the girls are all right, aren't they? And, you know, that was, that really helped a lot, that the painting was really, the paintings were not that important. The children were much more important. The problem for police investigating the theft was that it was far from clear precisely when the paintings had been stolen, as Michael Backwin freely admits. In my opinion, the way it happened is that we came back and we went to the house and these paintings were all in the dining room. And we didn't go into the dining room, we went to the rest of the house. And... In fact, it was two days before it was discovered that the paintings were missing. They could have been in and out of there within a relatively very short period of time, five or ten minutes. Just who had carried out the robbery remained a mystery. But in small town Stockbridge, suspicion fell on someone with knowledge of the Backwin household. He's not an ostentatious guy. He had local friends. And um, for some reason, the treasures that were in his dining room became known uh, to the wrong people. There were a number of people who knew friends that I had that came into the house who, uh, who knew about it. And I guess some were quite impressed with it. There was some concern that possibly it might have involved someone who knew the family or had worked at the house. I would say small town. Um, you know, people, people gossip and people know. My theory, and particularly my wife's theory, that one of my friends uh, just talked too much. And that's how this all happened. I think it was just living in that community uh, gave them this false sense of security that they were in a secluded area. They weren't pals with rough, tough people. They were pals with the cultured. The next month, in June 1978, there were four anonymous calls to the Backwin house. And we don't know who the person was, but he was very, very nervous and really wanted to get out of this whole mess. And I don't think he ever even asked for anything, but he did tell us that they were in a, a barn in a field not too far from Boston. But the calls stopped, and this glimmer of hope petered out. Michael Backwin soon suspected that the theft of his paintings might not be a priority to the police. It wasn't a very important thing to them. Uh, their concept, in my opinion, was this was some rich person who lost some possessions and let's go on and find the, the, the drug dealers and so on. Eventually, the whole thing just sort of petered out. And from then on, the private detective took over 
As the frustration mounted, Michael Backwin eventually turned to this man, Charlie Moore. Charlie Moore is a private detective living in Plymouth. For years, he specialized in art crime, tracking down and retrieving stolen works of art. I was contacted by Mr. Backwin in December of 78 at the suggestion of federal authorities out in the Springfield area. Um, I met with Mr. Backwin and uh, agreed to investigate uh, the theft of his paintings uh, aimed at trying to recover the ones that were stolen. When well, hired Charlie Moore, and I think Charlie did a lot of work on this thing. I did give him a contract that he would get a percentage if he found the paintings. Once Charlie Moore started working on the case, some key facts became clear. They had a housekeeper keeping an eye on the house. Four people came to that house during that weekend, allegedly to check the mail for Mr. Backwin, um, and they found that the front door was unlocked. And there were suspects right away as to maybe have a knowledge of the theft. Backwin never gave any authorization for these people to come to the house or check the mail. I believe that the two people that stole the paintings uh, got information from people that had been in the house prior. And I also believe that the reason for taking those paintings was to ransom them back uh, for money to either pay for a lawyer or to ne negotiate um, a pending criminal charge. Meanwhile, police had a lucky break that put a small-time local crook in the frame. His name was David Colvin. Colvin had approached someone in early June, several days after the theft, and had said to this person, I have access to stolen paintings, and I have access to guns. The man whom he approached happened to be a federal undercover agent. The agent from the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Unit identified David Colvin as the man trying to sell him the guns and the paintings. Colvin did a deal with him, and for that deal, Colvin was indicted on that gun charge. There was no real interest in pressing him what he might have done with the uh, stolen paintings. Colvin was 32 and a well-known crook and gambler. He came from Pittsfield, less than 20 miles from the Backwin house. He was married, living out in the Pittsfield area. Uh, he had a brother out there. Um, and he was raised out there. His parents lived there as well. Colvin was fairly well known by the authorities. Uh, he had had some scrapes with the law. He had had some drug deals, smaller stuff, not major cases. More than that, Colvin and Backwin had actually met. I had met him a few times. And uh, when I was in the inn business there, I knew almost everybody I had. It was a big fish in a small pond. You get to know lots of people. And, they came down to my place, and uh, I would see them. And, uh, I didn't know him that well, but I had met him a couple of times. Colvin knew a lot of people uh, from growing up there. You meet some people who are not very nice, uh, some people who are maybe a little bit outside the law. And I talked to a few of them, and they wouldn't say a word, even though I think they knew something. They were, I knew they were frightened. And I had asked around, and there were some, I think, fairly powerful crooks <laughs> in, uh, involved in this thing, and Coven being one of them, somebody who they should really investigate. Colvin was already in deep trouble on gun charges. He found himself a lawyer, Robert Martirosian. He was a steady lawyer that kept busy doing criminal cases, you know, representing defendants. I think the reason why he was approached is because Colvin was under uh, firearm charges. So I think he was trying to work his way out uh, of those charges, and that's why he was contacted. The criminal and his lawyer met at Martirosian's offices in Watertown, near Boston. Colvin was facing two major cases. He's got the grand jury going on in Boston regarding the theft from the uh, Backwood home, and he's got this federal case hanging over his head over the gun case. Uh, somehow he learns that Bob Monterosian would be an individual who could represent him. In July 1978, 
he visits Mount Erosion at Mount Erosion's office in Watertown. It's the first time uh, that the two men have met. When the meeting was over, Robert Martirosian offered to put his client up for the night in the attic of another office he had across town. Colvin spent the night at Mount Erosion's law office because the next morning he was going in for an arraignment on the gun trafficking case. Bob Mount Erosion said he had no place to stay and he didn't have the money to put himself up. So Bob offered his attic and Colvin took advantage of it. In July 1978, David Colvin was sentenced in Boston for the firearms offenses. He got a year's probation. It was a different story when Colvin came before a grand jury investigating the theft from Michael Backwin. David Colvin, he didn't say much. He pleaded the Fifth Amendment and said nothing. Anybody who was called the grand jury said nothing, so that didn't do any good. Others who knew the comings and goings of the back winds did testify, and they could not come up with a strong enough lead to indict anybody. For the moment, at least, Colvin was a free man. But if the police thought they'd found the robber, they soon had a problem. Colvin's gambling finally got him into serious trouble with the criminal underworld in which he moved. He owed money to a couple of guys from a gambling debt in Boston, and they came out to collect. In February 1979, two Boston men drove to Colvin's home in Pittsfield. They needed to call in a gambling debt, just $1,500. He refused to pay. A fight ensued. Allegedly, he reached for his gun. There was a scuffle. And as the killer later claimed in court, fearing for his life, he drew his 38 revolver and shot Colvin dead. One of the men was let go. He was uh, cleared uh, on a self-defense charge. The other man who actually shot him went to jail for 10 years for manslaughter. I felt happy and, and sad. Uh, I was glad that, and I thought maybe this would scare people into to saying something, but nothing, I think it just made them even more nervous. Colvin's death stops the investigation as far as who stole it. That was the end of the trail. The police now had a problem. With the prime suspect dead, they were further than ever from finding Michael Backwin's precious Cezanne. Private detective Charlie Moore wasn't doing much better. Gotten a few phone calls, and the one in particular thought they saw the Cezanne painting, the bowl of fruits hanging on a wall in a condo in Boston. So we started an investigation against that man. We tried to get into his condo unit a couple of times, legitimately. Uh, we couldn't get in there, and then when we finally did, that painting was not in there. Charlie did a lot of work on this thing. We also had another suspect that moved from Massachusetts to Florida. We put surveillance on it, but that proved to be negative, but it took quite a bit of time before we figured that out. He thinks he found the paintings being moved from one place to another. We thought the paintings may have been traded for drugs. But that didn't work out that well. We sort of lost them in the Florida area. There were some pretty bad people, so we decided to back off of that. But he continued to work on it. We tried to locate the other person we thought was involved in the theft. We had information that he had moved out to the West Coast. We tried to locate him out there, but we never did find him. We kind of let that end go. So these are the kind of operations we were taken after Mr. Colvin was murdered. Uh, and we know we pursued that right up, uh, you know, up to 99, 2000. In the search for the stolen art, the focus shifted to London and to this man, Julian Radcliffe. Radcliffe runs the Art Loss Register, 
an international business that finds stolen works of art. The idea is simple and designed to stop thieves ever being able to sell a stolen picture on the open market. The Art Loss Register database logs descriptions of stolen art and antiques, which can be easily searched for a suspect piece. We take the details of the pictures and photographs of them and place it on a searchable database and then search 300,000 items which are sold during an average year against those items to try and find them. The descriptions of Backwin's treasured Cezanne and the six other paintings were lodged with the art loss register. Backwin sold his house in Massachusetts soon after the robbery and moved to Virginia. As the years passed, the art loss register became his best hope of getting the paintings back. Well, I'll tell you a very funny thing. I'd never heard of Art Loss Register. I called Sotheby's and Christie's and other places, and they had heard of them, and they knew what they were, so... Uh, but it still seemed a little bit strange. Yeah, I did say he'd have it. Uh, Julian is a strange guy. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, they're very good. Radcliffe was confident that one day the power of the Art Loss Register would finally retrieve Michael Backwin's paintings. The breakthrough finally came when insurance underwriters Lloyds of London was asked to insure a Cezanne painting for transportation to England. They checked the painting on the art loss register. It was Michael Backwin's. The request to Lloyds had come from an Englishman working in the construction business in Russia. He was approached by some Russians and they said, can you help us sell some pictures? And he quite innocently said, I don't know anything about pictures, but I'll see what I can do to help. Julian Radcliffe set up a meeting at the offices of Lloyd's in the city of London. I said, put those people who contacted you in touch with me if you don't want to stay in the picture. Initially, he said, I don't think I do want to stay in the picture. This sounds as though this could be the Russian Mafia. They wanted $15 million for the pictures. We said, we're not gonna give you any money unless you tell us how you got them and who you are. The negotiations went on inconclusively for months. It was not even clear whether the Cezanne was in Russia at all. Back in America, Michael Backwin at last thought he was getting closer to seeing his beloved Cezanne again. Well, that was kind of exciting then. And of course, the other amazing thing was that we knew then they had told us that all seven paintings were still together. That amazed me. And we just have thought that they would have tried to get rid of some of them. Is that really in your view? The people holding the paintings turned out to be a mysterious organization called Erie International Trading Company, registered in Panama. The company employed a Swiss lawyer named Dr. Bernard Vischer to negotiate on their behalf. Radcliffe never knew, nor did Fisher ever say, who was behind Erie International. All he was dealing was with, with, with a lawyer. Julian Radcliffe flew to Switzerland during the summer of 1999 for numerous meetings. He seemed to be getting nowhere. During July and August, these negotiations carried on, and eventually, in September, I said, having cleared this with the FBI, that we might be prepared, since we were making no progress, to take the Cezanne and sign over to them the other six pictures. It was a deal with the devil. Radcliffe believed that these people who had the paintings at the time had gotten them knowing that the paintings were stolen. The other six pictures at that time were worth, say, half a million dollars. The Cezanne we knew was worth at least 15. In order to get back a very important picture, 
the police agreed that this would be a reasonable thing to do. But there was a catch. Radcliffe wanted certain guarantees from Dr. Vischer about the people behind the mysterious Erie International. I said that he would have to make a declaration which he would have to sign saying he knew it was true about how his client got the pictures, who his client was, and answering a whole list of other questions. And that envelope would be lodged with a neutral lawyer in London. Vischer's client signed the declaration as well. And the envelope was put into a safe at the offices of London solicitors Herbert Smith. Though Michael Backwin was desperate to see the return of his missing paintings, he only consented reluctantly to Julian Radcliffe's plan. In my opinion, this is kidnapping. This is a ransom you're paying. I actually said, no, I'm not really interested in that. But Julian, if you think that's a good way to, to do it, do it. And you will find that my signature has never been on that document that actually gave those paintings to them. Julian Radcliffe flew to Geneva to clinch the deal. Radcliffe and his lawyer were joined by the head of Sotheby's Impressionist and Modern Art Department, Michel Strauss. It's a real thrill asked to go along and, um, you know, because you, you didn't know what was going to happen. Was, some, was nothing going to happen? Was the painting going to be produced? How was it going to be produced? It was just after lunch, about 2 o'clock, that uh, we went to this uh, lawyer's office in one of the streets in the center of Geneva. The crucial meeting with Bernard Vischer was to be at the offices of Julian Radcliffe's Swiss lawyer. It didn't get off to a very good start. Julian and I were shown upstairs into a large waiting room. Vishka started ringing up saying he was going to be late, like two hours late, three hours late. And everybody started thinking that this thing might never come off. It might all be a scam. I didn't know what was going on between Julian and the lawyer. The son of his personnel and a number of other people were thinking the whole of this was uh, not worth doing. I just had to wait and wait and wait, and I think for about an hour and a half. It was quite tense because, according to Picasso, this was one of the greatest ever pictures, and it was the foundation of Cubism. So this was an extraordinarily important picture. I kept on being told, just another five minutes, he'd suddenly appear, he'd head around the door, said, we're almost there. Just as the waiting became unbearable, Dr. Vischer walked in with a briefcase bulging with papers. Eventually, he turns up looking harassed, wet, and sweaty. <laughs> And uh, he says, well, I'm sorry, I haven't got all the documents, but I've got enough documents to hand over the Cezanne. The and there were about six documents to be signed. He had three or four of them, but not all of them. And I said, that's fine, I'll sign these. You hand over the Cezanne. And he then said, well, excuse me. And he went out of the building. Then Vischer made a call from his cell phone, and everyone went down to the courtyard. We were standing underneath the trees, and he went down the street.
and a car came along and handed the Cezanne out in a black plastic bin liner out of the window to him, and he came scuttling back into the building. The group then returned to the office. The door opened. This lawyer appeared, carrying a black plastic bin bag in the shape of a rectangular object. And he just pushed it at me and said, here it is. So I was a bit surprised. And um, the first thing I did was to kneel down on the floor with the painting. And I opened a corner with my finger. I opened a corner of the black plastic. He looked at it, because I told him to say nothing at the time. Then there was some white sort of padding underneath that, which I also pulled aside, because I, I was too impatient to unwrap the whole thing. And as soon as I saw a small part, I suppose a two-inch square section of the painting, I knew immediately from the colors and the brush strokes that that was a Cezanne. And he said to me, I only need to look at one brush stroke. I know it's Suzanne. Because I was so familiar with his work. I've been, you know, 40 years I've been looking and studying and, and selling his paintings. And that was it. We had the real thing. I went into another room with him. He told me that it was the right picture and I could be confident of signing for it. It's a real thrill, you know, being asked to go along. And it was one of the big most exciting things I've done. I took all the packaging off, uh, lent the painting up against the wall, surrounded by, by its packing materials, and, and photographed it for my own, uh, for a record of what I'd just seen, what had just happened. Radcliffe had pulled off the biggest art recovery in modern art heist history. But in his heart, he knew this was only half the story. I interviewed Mr. Radcliffe soon after he struck that deal, and he said to me at the time that he didn't believe that that agreement that he signed really had much legal value. He thought because the paintings had been stolen, the agreement had been, quote, coerced, unquote, out of him. Radcliffe was convinced that whoever had held the Cezanne all those years knew more about the original robbery than they were letting on. Indeed, their lawyer, Dr. Vischer, had inadvertently divulged crucial information. Vishka let slip one or two facts which I didn't know, I had not given to him, and could only have come from somebody concerned with the theft or with the family. He knew that the key was kept under the frog by the front door. We know that's how they got in. There were a number of little things like the frog and the key, which indicated to me that Vishka's clients knew a lot. But I couldn't work out who they were. Meanwhile, the Cezanne went on show in New York. Michael Backwin now had the painting back, but he'd already decided that there was no way he could provide the right security for such a masterpiece. It came to New York, and they were very nice. They let me spend a little time uh, with it, and still a tear comes to my eye when I think about that beautiful painting. And, uh, it was really, it was a very, very emotional thing, and uh, I'm still sad that I could not have ever afforded to keep it again, but...
the Cezanne went up for auction at Sotheby's in London. The estimate was nine to 12 million. That was the range that we thought it could, it could fetch. I remember the bidding was rather slow to begin with. Bidding started at about six million pounds. It crept over the low estimate. It kept on going up and up, hundreds of thousands, 500 thousands. They crept up to the high estimate. Probably 12, 13 million pounds. There were, I think, just two people in it. And then quite briskly it moved up to 18 million pounds. Everyone was thrilled in excitement, and we certainly never expected to see a price like that. Which I think was largely due to the quality of the painting and its rarity. I remember the art loss register person who was on my right said, oh, thank God, there might be a bonus and I can afford the uh, new boiler. <laughs> Backwin's treasured Cezanne was bought by an anonymous telephone bidder. It's just like, there's your old friend you're saying goodbye to again, and that's very sad. And I don't know how I'd feel if I ever see it in a museum again, <laughs> but I think that uh, it would be okay. And I'm glad that it has a nice home. I know where it is, and I'm very happy, so. But Backwin had to wait another five years for any more news about his six missing paintings. In early 2005, four of the six remaining paintings suddenly turned up for sale at Sotheby's in London. The two Soutines, the de Vlaminck, and the Utrillo. In 2005, we're contacted by Sotheby's. So I said to Sotheby's, first of all, find out who is selling them. Once again, it was Erie International Trading Company. Julian Radcliffe became more convinced than ever that the people he was dealing with had some link to the original robbery. I knew from that that the people behind the area were almost definitely criminals. But we had to prove it, and we could then say we want to open the envelope in order to see who it is behind the area. Radcliffe's legal team now needed to convince the court that he had entered into the original agreement to retrieve the Cezanne under duress. Our approach was to say, well, the arbitration agreement um, was forced upon Mr. Backwin uh, by duress. He had no choice. If he wanted to recover one or more paintings, he had to sign that agreement. The information in the envelope was critical to the finding of, of duress. The judge at the high court agreed and ordered that the envelope be opened. The judge said by six o'clock, Herbert Smith were to make that envelope available to us. That evening, I went along to Herbert Smith, the lawyers who'd held the envelope for six years. We were shown into a room very much like this one by a solicitor who disappeared. Then came back with, it wasn't really an envelope, it was like a pack. In fact, Radcliffe thought he knew from his own research who was behind Erie International. But would he be proved right? It was quite dramatic. We had no idea what was in this envelope. I mean, possibly there could be, there was nothing. I'd made a joke, I hope the rats hadn't eaten the contents. Or there could just be a piece of paper saying Mickey Mouse or something, you know, stupid like that. Quite a possibility that when you open the envelope, you find a note in it saying, um, take a running jump or <laughs> something of that sort. So we proceeded to um, open this envelope and it was really covered in various layers of plastic sheets until we reached some sort of, uh, there were two postcards basically stuck um, to one another. Um, I think they were from, from Australia. 
Um, and, you know, we looked inside the two postcards, which were sort of stuck together with a tape, and we couldn't see anything inside, so we thought that was it, you know, that's it, there's nothing in there. Uh, it was a con. Eventually we found that stuck to one of the postcards was yet another piece of paper and behind that another piece of paper until at the very end we found the actual declaration. I already had the signature of my left hand and as we opened the document... It was the same signature. There was the same signature in my right hand someone called Robert Mardi Rosian. I thought, QED. <laughs> so Robert Mardi Rosian, the defense lawyer nearly 30 years earlier for the prime suspect, David Colvin, had the paintings all along. How could that have happened? In Boston, it wasn't long before the media tracked down Robert Martirosian to get his side of the story. Made the phone call 8.30 in the morning, and Bob was asleep. His wife answers the phone, and I heard her whisper, Bob, it's, it's Steve Kirchner from the Boston Globe. And I said, hi, Steve, how are you doing? Fine, Bob. Your name came up in court, as you probably know. I knew what was going to happen today, Steve. And I said to him, Bob, this is bad. This is really bad, Bob. And he said, uh... What can I do, Steve? And I said, you can tell me how you got possession of the paintings. What happened to you? Well, I was representing a fellow... Robert Martirosian began to tell Steve Kirkchen his version of how he came by the paintings and why he'd hung on to them for so long. It went for about an hour. And that's when he told me exactly how he had gotten possession of the paintings, how David Colvin had walked into his office probably less than two months after the, the theft. The theft of millions of dollars in artwork from a Stockbridge man, Michael Baquin, 28 years as ago. As well as talking to the Boston Globe, Martirosian also went on local radio. Joining us on the line right now is Robert Martirosian. Good morning, Mr. Martirosian, and thanks very much for speaking with us. That's okay. Tell us uh, how you came into possession of the pictures. Well, I was representing a fellow uh, named Colvin who apparently took these paintings, but I was representing him on another case in the federal court. Came into my office to talk with me about the case we were going in on the next morning. Martirosian said Colvin was carrying a large bag. In my mind, it's a black plastic bag, and it's, it's, Bob Martirosian says, it. no idea what's in the plastic bag. And time he came in, he had this bag full of paintings. And he asked Colvin what's in the plastic bag. Colvin says, oh, I got a bunch of stolen paintings. I'm bringing them down to Miami, and I'm going to fence them. And he's telling me he's already sold them or fenced them in Florida. I told him, David, if you get caught with stolen paintings, it's going to make my defense of you on this gun charge that much more difficult. And I said to him, geez, you know, you've you got this case going here that we're involved in. If you get caught, it's really going to hurt your case that I'm defending you on. You know, you might get caught and it's going to ball everything up, basically telling him, you know, uh, you shouldn't be doing that. And that's his only conversation that he has with Colvin about the paintings. And then he didn't have a place to sleep that night, so I had a, another office in another building and there was an attic in the building, and uh, there was a little room up there, and so he went up there. Colvin brought the, the bag with him, and that was the last he saw of the bag. That's the last he saw of the paintings. Next day we went in, we had our court thing. Maybe six months after I saw him. He'd been shot. And he's dead. He's dead, okay. About a year later, I go up into this attic because there was some pigeons and stuff up there. And then I see this bag of paintings. He said, I knew right away, without even opening it, that's Colvin's pl plastic bag. He had left them here and opened it up. And sure enough, there were the paintings. Well, the first thought that comes to me is, uh, you know, I, I can return these paintings and, and get a reward for it. That's very common. That's very normal. And there's no problem with that. He didn't know if the paintings had been insured and whether or not Mr. Backwin had recovered uh, the insurance money and that, in fact, the paintings belonged to the insurance company. So 
So Marta Rosian decided to move the paintings around the world, supposedly for safekeeping. He said he hoped to find a way of returning them to Michael Backwin for a finder's fee, say 10% of their value. First of all, he shipped the paintings out of America to Europe by container. The hall of paintings probably arrived first in the Mediterranean, possibly Monaco, famously called a sunny place for shady people. They probably stayed here in southern Europe until they were moved on to their final resting place over the Alps into Switzerland and into a bank vault. They never went near Russia. The whole Russian negotiating tactic was to make it difficult for us to trace, and maybe we'd be too frightened to try and trace in Russia, which was then a cowboy country, to try and trace who the people really were behind this. Difficult questions now arose for Robert Martirosian. Mr. Martirosian, why didn't you just return the paintings instead of trying to profit from it? I mean, these well, were stolen artworks. Well, first of all, I didn't know who had ownership of them, and I wanted to get a reward for them. Isn't that extortion? No. No, I don't think it is. Well, look, that's the story. That's, that's what it is. Those things could have been sold or fenced a hundred times. Do you but regret, the, the main, do you regret but, taking but all main, this time? The, obviously, there are a lot of things I should have done that I didn't do. But the main thing is, where did it go? Where did it end up? They were on their way to Florida someplace. If it were not for me, Bob Matarosian, Bakewin would not have had that particular painting back, and he would be out $30 million. The irony is that Robert Martirosian gave up the law years ago to become a painter and sculptor. He's now working under the name Romard and thought to be living in the south of France. The FBI are still interested in his role in the disappearance of the paintings nearly 30 years ago. And Michael Backwin and his advisors still have some scores to settle. He used to pay me my expenses, which have been quite substantial. And three million dollars. Julian is again <laughs> very confident that we'll get quite a bit of this. I am not. The lesson that will guide to everybody is, it doesn't matter whether you sit on pictures for 10 years or 30 years, if you try and sell stolen pictures, you will be caught. And therefore, it's not worth stealing pictures. In the summer of 2006, four of Michael Backwin's paintings were still being held by Sotheby's in London, awaiting a court order to release them to their rightful owner. And two are still missing. According to Michael Backwin, who as a young man dreamed of owning a very particular painting by Cezanne, there is a moral to this 30-year-long tale. I no longer am that much interested in possessions. And I know my second youngest daughter always used to think that she liked the best about me is that I could afford a Mercedes but never had one. I don't care about that kind of thing very much, unless I thought it was the most beautiful thing in the world to have flew around with and didn't care that much, but they're too damn expensive. Just like these paintings are too damn expensive.